watch this vidcast or I'll gouge your eyes out. Welcome back, Horror Hounds, to Ghostman and Rivera's Horror Show Podcast. I'm Mike Ghostman Pickle. And I'm James Rivera. Today we have an interview with John Laper. He is an indie horror uh, movie producer with Siphuno Ventures. They produce such films as Be My Cat, a film for Anne, Don't Fuck in the Woods, um, a Tom Savini documentary, and The Velocipaster, which Mike and I actually uh, reviewed a couple months, few months back on the show, I believe, right before the pandemic. Yeah. Yeah, check out those old episodes and, and hear what we say about Velocipaster. We, we enjoyed that one. So if you're a filmmaker and you need advice on breaking into the industry, what distributors are looking for, things like that, take note. We'll give you advice. So please enjoy our interview with John Laper. Horror show exclusive. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome John Laper to the podcast. How are you doing today, John? I'm doing pretty good about yourself. Pretty good, pretty good. So how are you handling your quarantine? Uh, I mean, um, I, I've act, I'm actually physically disabled, so it's really not a huge uh, difference for me, mm-hmm. honestly. <laughs> yeah. Where did you grow up at? Uh, I grew up, I spent most of my childhood in uh, right around Portland, Maine. What prompted you to move to Buffalo, New York City? Um, I moved to uh, to Buffalo right after I graduated um, from college in Maine. I graduated uh, with a theater degree uh, mm-hmm. from the University of Southern Maine. Um, and the, the job and career-wise, Maine is just horrible. It's a tourist industry. A okay. uh, full third of the state move, uh, moves to Florida in the winter. Entire towns shut down. It's there's, there's just no opportunity out there. For those of you who don't know who John is, uh, he's a producer. He's produced over 40 films, including Be My Cat, which we talked to the uh, the director a few weeks ago. Uh, Velocipaster uh, just came out this past year. Excellent uh, exploitation like B type of movie, and then Smoke and Mirrors, the story of Tom Savini, and Don't Fuck in the Woods. So. Could you tell us about your journey from being in the Navy to being an actor and then being a producer? Um, well, Navy was, um, I got ended up, I, I tried joining the Navy uh, after high school. Um, I was actually going to be in the uh, the nuke uh, division. So I would have basically like nuclear physicist. Uh, I would have been maintaining uh, reactors on board, uh, probably aircraft carriers. The, the other option would have been submarines, but I'm, uh, I'm, pretty sure I'm too tall for those. There's actually a, a height restriction as far as like who's allowed on board subs. Um, but I, I ended up getting uh, kicked out before I made it all the way through boot camp. Uh, it was a it was a general discharge for medical reasons. Um, so I ended up going into college. Uh, I pursued a theater uh, degree uh, with an emphasis on acting um, with the intention of applying that towards film. Uh, but I just kind of fell into uh, producing um, with a specialty in uh, the finding uh, the funds uh, for low budget filmmakers. And then um, I also recently, uh, not too recently, uh, a little bit more than a year now, uh, became the co-owner of uh, the Siphuno Ventures sales agency, which I, uh, I used to do uh, freelance for. So you originally wanted be an actor how did you switch over from oh i don't know if you wanted to be an actor but i know that you trained in the Chekhov method of acting Mm -hmm. how did you switch over from acting to producing well um i was actually i was still in college uh i ended up joining uh a horror facebook group um uh, and i came across this one guy who was making an indie film he was looking for producers to do like small sums to invest in it It was like just a small movie like two thousand dollar found footage flick uh, i ended up investing like five hundred dollars that was my first in, in uh executive producer role um that one's not on my imdb anymore uh because i removed myself from it later on after the director started stealing from the producers uh, but that is how I met my my business partner Adam because that was also that was the first movie that he represented for distribution. He uh, he got distribution with uh, Gravitas Ventures. It actually ended up on Hulu 
and it made a little bit of money. Um, so I did uh, I did the freelance work for uh, for him after that, and then more recently I became the co-owner. Acting, I try to do a little bit here and there if I can, but with the with my injuries, it's really not something I'm striving for so much anymore. Were you into horror movies from a young age? Actually, the funny thing is, I was um, I was sheltered as a child. I grew up in a very traditional Christian household, okay. um, and like my I, my mom wouldn't even let me watch Wizard of Oz until I was probably like eleven or twelve because she thought the witch was too scary. <laughs> okay. But, my uh, my dad though he let us get away with a few more things than my mom and um, one Halloween I think I was sixteen when they finally let me start watching some of that stuff they uh, I watched um, uh, the first Halloween on Halloween uh, my dad even got me a, a Michael Myers mask for my uh, for my Halloween costume that year okay and I've just loved loved the genre ever since the second film you produced was uh, Be My Cat, this excellent uh, found footage film. How did you meet Adrian Tofay and how did you become involved with that project? Actually, I think that was the same thing. I think I met him in a horror Facebook group uh, looking for funding for the movie. Uh, it sounded very interesting to me. Uh, it was, um, it was um, the first found footage film ever to come out of Romania. My first movie had already been a found footage Mm -hmm. And I always love found footage. I, I, I just love that genre. I know it gets a lot of heat from some people. It's very controversial, but it's one of my favorite subgenres of horror. Um, so, I, you know, I talked to him through email a little bit, and I ended up, yeah, I ended up uh, investing a little bit in the movie. Uh, it was, to, my, to, to this day, that's still probably one of my favorite movies that I have my name on. Uh, just Adrian is extremely talented and dedicated. Yeah. Uh, he lived as his character for like a full month. I don't know if he told you guys that. The only way that his actors knew whether he was speaking English, wh wh whether he was uh, speaking as his character or as the director, was if he was speaking English, he was his character. If he switched over to Romanian, he was the director. Okay. <laughs> you so, um, It was crazy because he would send me... Um, he would send me like little clips like during the production and it was all like so real and authentic. Like at one point, uh, um, you guys have seen the film, the, the scene where yeah. he performs uh, the one woman. Mm -hmm. uh, he sent me that clip and it was so real. I reached out to that actress to make sure she was okay. So did, <laughs> did you, uh, and what did she say when you finally reached out? To oh her? yeah, yeah, she was fine. Yeah, they were the, the actresses were just diehard uh, method actors right alongside them. They very very into their roles. So that was the second movie that you did. You used right. to go by the name of Johnny Macabre. Yeah, uh, that was okay. Uh, I I used to run uh, a horror news website, thebloodshed.com, and a lot of the people that uh, write for those usually do come up with some sort of pen name, mm -hmm. and that uh, that happened to have been mine. When I uh, when I did uh, run the site, and you no longer go by that name, no. uh, when producing, no, no, okay. James and I are both fans of the uh, film that you produced, Velocipaster. <laughs> How did you get involved with that film, and what was your contributions to the production? Well, that was a, that was another film that we uh, we wrapped uh, for distribution uh, through Cyclone Ventures. Um, I actually met. Um, Brandon, I believe, uh, at, at a local uh, film festival here in Buffalo, the Buffalo Dreams Fantastic Fest. And um, I wasn't actually, I was not co-owner of, of Sifuno yet. I was just doing the freelancing where I was like bringing him films and then he would pursue them uh, to, uh, to rep them and I'd just get a small cut. Um, so he saw me actually, Adam saw me talking about Velocipaster on my Facebook page uh, and he sat, thought it sounded interesting, and he ended up reaching out to them. And, uh, yeah, he represented that uh, that movie, and uh, we got distribution with, which one was that one? I think that one was Wild Eye, uh, and it's gone viral probably three different times now. <laughs> <laughs> Were you surprised at how much the film blew up? 
I think we were all surprised um, by how much that film blew up. I mean, we had, it's, it's so hard to tell with these movies. I mean, we had one movie we thought was going to do amazingly um, called Scrawl. You probably see that on there. Because that one right there, uh, that is an indie horror film that is actually Daisy Ridley's uh, feature debut. That's that's Ray from Oh, Star. wow. Yeah, she did that the same year that she did, uh, earlier in the same year that she did Force Awakens. I want to know who that her agent is that gets her from a $20,000 horror movie to Star Wars within 12 months. <laughs> <laughs> but so, uh, yeah, that one didn't perform super well. And then Velocipaster just blew up. So it's, it, you know, it's crazy. It, it, we really have been, uh, ever since that, and Don't Fuck in the Woods to a smaller degree, also went viral a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, we've really been trying to look for more of the really weird and out there movies. Because, like, the take, take your Sharknado. I mean, there's a formula you can follow, honestly, and it just, it works. People yeah. love it. Uh, what determines whether or not you're going to get involved in a project? Are there certain things that you look for when you're um, deciding whether or not you're going to come on as a producer? Um, I mean, as far as representing a movie, I will, I mean, we don't really have too much as far as like the actual people. Whereas mm -hmm. like if I'm looking for funding for a film for somebody, I usually don't work with first time directors anymore. I've, been burned too many times on that okay. um but as far as uh representation uh for the films to help them uh get distribution we usually look for uh well obviously bigger names are always a plus um you know name actors like horror icons kane hodder tony todd etc um production value i don't care what the budget is if it looks good i mean we'll, we'll represent it one of the best movies I ever seen um, recently for for horror, um, and one unfortunately we missed out on representing. He just chose to do it, you know, himself. He did self distribution. Actually, I get from what I understand, he did pretty well with it. So, you know, kudos to him. Uh, this movie called Fear Footage, which was a found footage anthology film, and the guy he he met, he had a two hundred dollar budget, and he shot it and edited it entirely on his iPhone. And it looks, it's amazing. It's one of the creepiest movies I've seen in years. So, I mean, if it looks good, I don't care if it was, if you spent $10 making it, you know? <laughs> okay. Do you prefer to get involved with serious or comedic horror? Is there a preference that you have? Because it seems like you've done both. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, definitely either way. Uh, horror comedies, we're having to be a little bit more strict on just because they are a little bit harder to get a good distribution deal for. For example, Shudder, we have recently discovered, um, they, we've, been, we've started working with them. They don't really take horror comedies anymore. I mean, they have a few on their catalog already, but they're not really taking any new ones, it seems. So, I mean, there's, there's just a more limited market for them, unfortunately. Speaking of Shudder, uh, you have a, a documentary on there, Smoke and Mirrors, the Tom Savini story. Yes. So what, what, what was your contribution to that production, and how is producing a documentary different from a narrative feature? Well, I mean, that one um, was already finished by the time we got on board. Uh, and that was another one that we, uh, we did represent for distribution. Uh, we got that on the Shudder. Um, and I will say, uh, I can't go into too many details right now, but that did lead to a um, partnership that we're actually going to be forming with Shutter going forward. Um, it's going to be it's going to be very interesting. It's going to be uh, about the most I can say is it's going to involve us releasing a slate of about uh, half a dozen films a year under a special label. Oh wow! Wow! Yeah. So this is going to be something complete, like um, like a completely new label from um your normal Sifuno. Uh, Ventures. Well, it'll be an addition, yeah. In addition, it, it'll be like you know, there'll be like a um, a label on like the the films, kind of similar to think like uh, eight films to die for. Ah, uh, okay. Remember, yeah, I forgot about those. The After Dark movies. Yeah, yeah. I, I I miss those. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, how did you get involved with the movie Don't Fuck in the Woods? 
And was it the title that drew you in? Did you see a kind of marketability or a possibility of going viral with some with that type of title? Yeah, I definitely um, saw the potential there right from the beginning. I, I told him that, like, you know, this could be like a, a lower budget Sharknado, basically. I mean, you could just keep pumping these out. I mean, we're actually representing the sequel right now. Um, so hopefully that will have distribution soon. Now, I met Sean, uh, Sean Burkett. Uh, I met him at Horror Hound once. Um, and that was back when I was working uh, for the Bloodshed. Um, and I actually interviewed him, uh, regarding don't, don't fuck in the woods. Okay. Now he ended up running into, um, some, some issues with production. So probably a full year later, I ended up seeing him posting, um, about, we ended up being friends on Facebook after meeting him at Horror Hound. And I saw him posting about trying to get back into production and he needed some more, uh, some more funding. So I helped him, uh, get good chunk of the funding for that movie so he could get it made. And then, um, and then, yeah, Siphuno Ventures, we got the, uh, the distribution deal for it. We got that one with, that one's with Gravitas here in the U S and I believe it's with terror films, uh, non U S. I know that you don't do too much acting, but you've acted in two full length feature films, one short film and an episode of television. How was uh, how was your experience acting on set, and what probably what was the thing that you had the most fun doing, and uh, as far as acting goes? Well, the the one episode of television was actually a little bit bigger. My the guy who ran it just did not want to put up a, an actual IMDb, so I just added a little thing. Um, okay. As far as acting on sets, I did the short film when I was back in Maine. Uh, that was actually that was actually a music video. Um, no, wait, no, no. I did makeup on a music video. I did act in the short film. Um, that was that was a fun one. That was that was done by a, a local metal band called Thirteen Winters. Uh, so it, it was a really fun set. They were a fun bunch of guys. It was extremely cold though because it was Maine and it was December. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, very, very cold. Uh, actually, part of the short film involved us marching through the woods with uh, torches. And between uh, between shoots, we would all huddle around the torches for warmth. Do you think so there's what, a lot of horror fans in Maine? There's... I think... I don't think there's any more horror, film, horror fans in Maine than any other place. And unfortunately, there was a smaller film community. Uh, much smaller because I mean the only real urban center at all in all of in the entire state is Portland the entire state only has like 1 million people it's extremely small it's a it's huge state probably about the size of New York but yeah just very sparsely populated overall what would you say are some of the main challenges that you face as a producer um well, one of my <laughs> biggest frustrations is trying to get a hold of people when I uh, see like a cool movie. Not everyone, because I do a lot of uh, we do a lot of uh, like first contact stuff. So, a lot of times we'll actually go and look for movies to represent, and we'll be the ones to reach out to the filmmakers. But it's really frustrating seeing like a really really cool movie, and then going on to IMDb Pro, and that that the director doesn't have their their email listed. So. <laughs> You know, if, if you're listening and you're doing movies and you want help, any help getting distribution, put your email on IMDb, please. You also did makeup. I have experience in FX and FX makeup on Wendigo Rising and Angry Dog. How did yeah. you get experience in the FX makeup? Actually, that was uh, something I learned in uh, college uh, during my, uh, my, my theater degree. Um, theater makeup was an elective you could take. Um, and just seemed really fun to me we did a i especially loved the the horror makeup okay. uh, but i learned a little bit of everything i mean we did some did some aging beauty makeup fantasy stuff um the final was actually doing like characters from uh midsummer a midsummer night's dream um 
but yeah, I mean, I, I love the horror stuff and I, I got more into it. I taught myself uh, a little bit here and there because I was, I, I worked on a couple uh, movies in Maine, but a couple of them fell through, unfortunately. But what I always did was I, I, I bought myself the, the tools off of um, Amazon. And anytime someone would ask me, are you able to do this? I would tell them, no, but I'll learn. And then I would teach myself how to do that. What attracts you to the horror genre as a producer? And is it the same things that attract you as a fan? Well, that and also horror is by far the most profitable genre, um, like dollar for dollar. I mean, Avengers makes, what, billion and a half dollars, but it also costs like 700 million to make. Uh, Paranormal Activity was made for 15,000 and made 300 million. That, that, that's the current uh, Guinness World Record holder for, uh, for budget to sales ratio. Before that was Blair Witch Project. I mean, obviously those are outliers, extreme outliers. Most movie, most horror films don't do nearly that well, but they, <laughs> they, they are a lot more easy to make money with than any other genre. Like some genres, we focus on horror, but we'll, we'll look at most films, but we won't even like consider like dramas or comedies unless they have name actors on them. They just, they don't make money. Why do you think it is that horror seems to make money with low budgets and no stars where comedies and dramas need something, uh, I guess, more marketable attached to it outside of the genre? Well, I think dramas are just very niche at this point. They're not very in style for one thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, Comedies are just straight up difficult to write. It takes a real, real talent to actually be able to write a, write a funny movie. Uh, It's just very difficult to do. Um, So it's, and and our network of distributors is definitely not geared toward those. Horror, uh, it's, you, you mentioned one thing right there. It can be made very cheaply and still look very good. Like I, like I mentioned with that uh, fear footage, movie two hundred dollar budget looks amazing. Um, and everyone, people like to be scared. It's cathartic. It's uh, people sit down and they watch a movie and for a little bit, you know, their problems are forgotten because you know, in comparison to whatever hell the people on the screen are going through, their problems might not seem all that big. Do you want to stay in the low budget indie horror world or, or do you eventually want to get into bigger budgets, especially with the shutter deal you have? Oh, we work with all budgets. We definitely, right now our percentages are probably more leaning heavily towards the lower side of things. But I mean, we our network is set up that we can handle films all the way from like no budget all the way up to seven digits. Um, and we've worked on a a few six digit films already with a couple more actually in the works. Uh, I'm actually in talks with a a couple, um, films right now that are really, really impressive. They, they've got some fantastic, uh, names attached to them. One of them in particular is very interesting because it's, uh, it's produced by a guy who, uh, is actually a, a voice actor. Um, and some pretty big stuff, like a lot of Nicktoons, uh, Cartoon Network stuff. And this film's cast is primarily voice actors, but they're all doing live performances. It's very something you don't see very often. And they're very, yeah. very, very big name. I, I will say one of them, I won't m- mention her by name, but you might be able to figure it out. Probably the biggest female voice actor currently in the industry is is the the prime the protagonist of this movie let me guess batgirl i'm not not gonna confirm or deny (laughs) either way you can guess all you want i think it's batgirl (laughs) just a guess (laughs) just a guess because i know tara strong is a pretty big thing in voice acting right now or she has been for a while actually so um do you uh do you plan on like for yourself ever maybe writing or directing your own feature film it's something I've thought about. I would be more into writing, potentially. I, I have written a short film already. I've tried writing a couple feature scripts, but I always kind of just end up, they end up unfinished. <laughs> but uh, directing, I'll be honest, scares the hell out of me. It's not anything I really 
do intend to do. Mm. I directed a play once, um, but really I have no intention of ever directing a, a film. Okay. You um the short segment that you did write for uh was for the film Year of Fear. Uh what is this movie? Is it an anthology picture and how did you get involved with it? It was supposed to be an anthology feature. That movie's still unreleased. Um oh, Okay. Yeah, um it was supposed to be an anthology basically. Uh the one guy was posting in a film group. He was looking for people to go in on this uh this film. The film, uh, the film's name was originally supposed to be Killer Shades, because each of the segments was supposed to share this one, this common theme that there was like this this um, pair of glasses that basically turned people into like evil serial killers, mm -hmm. essentially. Mm -hmm. um, mine was actually a script I had lying around already, which I just kind of attached the glasses into it. Um, the, the, the short film is called, um, it's called cat and mouse and it's, it's actually kind of like, um, don't breathe before don't breathe. It's, uh, two burglars break into this old guy's house with the intention of thinking it's a, it's an easy, an easy mark. Um, they subdue them. They go and search the house trying to find valuables. They're coming up empty. They search the basement and they find uh, in this one side room a whole bunch of bodies. This dude's a serial killer. They go upstairs, he's loose, and he starts chasing them through the house. Do you ever feel like um, with horror movies you have to strike fast? Because there's been so many instances where people will come up with an idea and then before you know it, that idea is already turned into a film by somebody else. I'm actually not one of those people that likes the whole... Um, cashing in uh, okay. type of filmmaking where like mockbusters where you're trying to rip off something bigger or trying to cash in on something that's popular right right now everyone's making um covid uh schlock horror movies it seems mm -hmm. uh, that's really popular right now um sharks so uh, uh <laughs> james, <clears throat> yeah uh James and I actually just uh, produced our first feature film. It's one that I wrote and directed called Pay Up. Mm -hmm. So what would be your advice for indie filmmakers like us who want to make their project more attractive to distributors? Um, okay, so first off, you definitely want to, you want to be in English language. Um, I mean, we rep movies from all over the world. It at least needs to have English subtitles because the U.S. English language territories are our primary market. Um, films need to be feature length. They need to be at least 60 minutes, preferably set, uh, 70, uh, and not too long either. Uh, Be My Cat, the original cut was a full two hours. And in order to get it distribution, we had to take uh, about 20 minutes off of that. Um, now let's see here. The, let's see. Don't be too artsy. I love art films, but like, doing black and white for aesthetics. Distributors hate that. They do not want a black and white movie. They don't. Um, and that, that's nothing against, against you know, filmmakers that use it. It's a cool effect and I totally get it from an artistic standpoint. It's just if you want the movie to make money, it's, it's just not gonna happen, unfortunately. Uh, obviously, name actors are a huge bonus. They're not a requirement, but they are probably the number one driver behind uh, getting an upfront payment from uh, distributors. Um, uh, let's see. There's one other one. Oh, yes. Definitely, when you're first starting your movie, this is probably the biggest one, honestly. When you're first starting your movie and you first create your IMDb page, do not put a date. Do not put a year anywhere on it. Do not put a year on it until you have distribution and you know exactly what year it is going to be released in because distributors will not take a movie if they look on IMDb and they see the year on it is more than two years ago. They don't care if it was actually just, just finished like last week. If the, if the year is showing two years ago, they are very unlikely to take it. It's, it's just to them, they view it as old back catalog stuff 
There's a couple distributors out there that will take back catalog films. Like they'll take an older film or even do a re-release, but they're very, very limited. And those don't usually make a whole ton of money. What are some of the, um, what movie would you say you're most proud of? Is it Be My Cat or is it something else? Oh, geez. Um, I'm very, I'm very proud of, I'm proud of a lot of them. Um, I mean, the Tom Savini documentary, having my name on, a, on the, the same film as some of those icons in that movie just blows me away. I mean, I have my name on a, that same film as George Romero. Mm -hmm. I, that's that's insane to me. Um, my name on the same film as Daisy Ridley, you know? Uh, but I mean, as far as just from like the, the film itself, without like looking at like the, any big exciting names or anything, I would probably say, yeah, it's probably still be my cat. Um, the, the amount of effort that went into that movie and just actually actually being a part of it during the production um, and seeing it from start to finish was very, very, uh, I, it was a very enjoyable experience. You said that you deal with a lot of filmmakers directly. So how often would you say that you uh, find projects at festivals and how often is it just straight to the filmmaker? Uh, honestly, I we we don't do, go to too many festivals. I go to the local one here in Buffalo every year. Uh, Fantastic Dreams, uh, Buffalo Dreams Fantastic Fest. It's run by um, uh, Greg Lamberson, uh, Slime City. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, he's he's probably the biggest name in uh, the Buffalo uh, film scene. Um, I see. I, I'm not opposed to going to any, like doing a short drive, but generally we don't go to too many festivals because we find a lot of the, the handshake deals that happen at film festivals or even at like AFM, they end up falling through. I mean, we actually, we do want to go to AFM at some point just to do some networking, but we much prefer to, to reach out to people directly through email. Uh, I myself, uh, probably once a month or so, I actually just sit down in front of my computer and I literally just browse through IMDb, looking at movies in post-production um, and, you know, looking for anything good that might need uh, representation. Is it a requirement for you to like the movie that you're representing or would you be interested in producing a movie that you personally don't like but might think is profitable? Oh, I will definitely, you know, if I think it's a good movie... It doesn't necessarily mean I like it. I mean, there's there's a difference between quality and taste. There's a lot of movies that I like that I can't represent because I like some of the more extreme gore stuff, but I can't pick those up because no main mainstream distributor is going to touch them. Mm -hmm. um, and I've had I've had some really good ones sent my way that I had to turn aside. Um, but yeah, as the as the reverse of that, you know, I'm not a which is. It's ironic, considering how much I like the extreme gore ones. I'm not a fan of Rob Zombie's films. Mm -hmm. I've had some films come my way that are in kind of similar style to that, and that's just not something I really like. But I also know, I mean, if it's good looking and it, there's a market for it, I mean, we'll definitely, you know, pick it up. Do you feel that the filmmakers should have it, a, like a lawyer or some type of representation before they go into the distribution process? I mean, it never hurts, but it's not really a requirement, I would say. Um, I would say if you're going to go do distribution yourself, you probably want someone who can look over the agreement and tell you what you're looking at. Um, but, I mean, lawyers can be expensive. Not everyone can afford one, unfortunately. Exactly. <laughs> I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't let a lack of a lawyer stop you from making your movie. What are some of your favorite horror movies, your personal favorite ones? Well, I do like the, the found footage genre, as I said. Uh, so I'm a big fan of like uh, original Blair Witch, the newer Blair Witch also. I, I liked the, the different direction that the two films took. That was interesting to me because the original one's obviously such like a slow burn. And the newer one just went goes batshit crazy like halfway through the movie. Um, <laughs> let me see. I like a very, very very small sub, uh, sub genre, um, military horror, like dog soldiers or dog uh, soldiers, yes. anything that's like, um, like the best trained humans versus something that they are just not trained to pace. 
I find those, I, I love those. Those are very fun for me. Uh, I also love um, supernatural slasher films. Um, you know, all the all the classics and the newer ones like Hatchet or um, well, Leslie Vernon isn't really supernatural, but that one was a fun one too. And um, I've really been liking some of the some of the. We we were stuck in this slog of like just ghosts and demons for like a decade. And we're finally starting to get out of it. And we're getting like some of these really original films like like uh, Quiet Place. I love that. Uh, it Follows. I thought it was a few years ago, but still fairly recent. Um, and a lot, actually, I, I, I do love uh, the foreign ones as well. One of them um, in particular, I remember, um, I think it's from Austria. Have you guys seen uh, Good Night, Mommy? Yes. I loved that movie. They actually sent me. Um, they sent me a toy cockroach uh, with the, uh, when they sent me the screener, and they asked me to do a, a publicity photo. So I stuck it in my mouth and took a selfie. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. So, so uh, how is the the lockdown affecting how distributors do business, or is the straight to video streaming even more in demand now? Well, uh, streaming is definitely uh, very in demand at the moment. Um, we haven't really reached the actual like drought of finished products, um, uh, because I mean, you know, at some point we're going to right now, we're still, we still have products coming in because of movies that finished before the, the pandemic, you know, just finally wrapping up their post-production, but eventually those are going to run out and movies that started before the pandemic or haven't even started yet and weren't able to finish before. There's going to be like probably two or three month gap there where there's going to be you know, a smaller selection of films available. Um, during the pandemic, a lot of the distributors have uh, at least temporarily downsized their staff. So, I mean, it is dip, um, communication is a little bit more difficult. Um, it's yeah, and overall right now it seems to be turning around. I'm starting to get, you know, more responses a lot quicker. Um, it, it, and uh, you know, we, I just signed a couple deals just uh, recently, so things are still moving. It's I'm just worried about what's that what that two month gap is going to look like when it hits. Well, we we were pretty bummed when we just finished our movie just before the lockdown, and then we were excited to send it to festivals, and then all of a sudden, the lockdown sends puts a wrench in all of that. We don't know what we're going to do in festivals now. So could this actually work to our advantage since there's a, a higher demand now for finished films? Um, I mean, it's definitely, it's not going to hurt your, your chances. I would definitely say, um, I'll be honest. I, we, like I said, I don't usually put too much, uh, faith behind the film festivals anyway. I mean, I, I love going to them and I love, uh, I do, you know, try to go to them to help, uh, get representation, but not all of them actually have people show up that are from, you know, a sales agency or a distributor. And if they aren't there, then, I mean, you get, you might get an award or something, but honestly, the distributors don't really look at awards too much. Okay. So, I mean, I, I love going to festivals and I'm definitely not knocking festivals. I'm just saying that they usually don't really play much of a component in the entire uh, you know distribution scheme of things, unless you're going to like a huge one like Sundance or something, you know. Um, but I mean, yeah, I mean, the streaming is definitely doing well. Um, Tubi, Tubi TV, has been a huge boon to the uh, the streaming side of things, especially uh, towards the the smaller budget indie films. Uh, it's basically uh, it's taken over the slot that Amazon used to used to fill because Amazon they they they're horrible they're they're just god awful they most of the time you're only getting like 2 cents per hour of viewing they're doing like at least I've noticed a trend at least once a year it seems they're removing hundreds of films like doing a once a year clean out and they're not even notifying the filmmakers uh, beforehand, I've been seeing tons of people uh, over the past few years after each of these, uh, you know, posting on their timelines that their movie is just off of Amazon now. They get, um, it's just, you know, they they give you some sort of 
spiel about like content or something but it's really i think it's i I think they're really just trying to keep the catalog fresh but you know it'd still be nice if they sent out some emails to people yeah Yeah. (laughs) pretty rude Um, (laughs) when do you foresee and i know that that this is hard for anybody to say but when do you foresee um films going back into production or do you feel like we're going to have like um do you think it's going to be a year or how how much do you think the pandemic is going to affect future productions well i mean some people are already being uh, very creative and they've figured out ways to make films during the pandemic i actually saw uh one movie that uh fairly recently uh this uh trailer for it uh conga tnt have you seen that the trailer for it so no. made a full-on uh, kaiju movie during the pandemic giant giant gorilla movie oh wow wow <laughs> yeah uh, i'm right now actually uh talking to a filmmaker about a movie that he made during the pandemic it's a um uh, a found footage film called house monster and uh it uh, looks like it's primarily just uh, just one character with the camera so i mean movies like that you know they're easier to do um they you don't a uh, lockdown really doesn't affect them too much as long as you pick your locations well. Uh, but as far as getting back to film festivals and films entering back into production, as far like normal production, I I don't see it happening this year, honestly. Okay. Mm-hmm. So you see like, um, since you're, uh, you're always searching out new projects uh, for, to, to distribute or produce, are there any um, trends that you see that are going to define horror going forward, or at least for the next few years? Any interesting trends in horror? Um, one thing I've been actually trying to plant some uh, some seeds uh, throughout, like the the, the industry, because um, not a lot of them get made. Werewolf movies are actually very, very, uh, very in very high demand uh, because not a lot of people make them. They're popular, and um, of the ones that are made, not a lot of them are good. So, <laughs> yeah, exactly. uh, those are very uh, in very high demand. A lot of those will get like different companies fighting over them and one upping each other on MGs, that type of thing. So, those are definitely um, something I'm trying to get more people to make right now. Um, the demon stuff is kind of going out a little bit, uh, zombies are still a little bit oversaturated um flashers are kind of they can they can they can still do well a lot of the better stuff right now is the more is the more zany weird stuff and just the the more original stuff that's a little bit harder to really categorize under a specific subgenre. would you say would you call those like experimental horror films or suppose they, they could fall under that category okay so also you said go on michael i was gonna say what would you say is more fulfilling to you in your career producing or distribution or do they go hand in hand for you well i mean the 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 producing is the the distribution when we when we uh help get the distribution for a film we're typically given an executive producer credit on that film Um, similarly also when i help find funding for a film i'm given a, a some sort of uh producer credit typically um now between funding and distribution definitely i prefer distribution uh it's a lot lower um pressure on me (laughs) honestly because uh the the distribution we we have this network built uh it's a it's we have these contacts they know us they love us we bring them a lot of product once we get the film out there that just kind of moves itself um funding is just hitting the bricks and hitting the bricks and posting and sending blind emails and like it, it's it can, it's difficult my, my specialty with it I, i'm not super good at getting like huge sums largest sum i've ever gotten for a film was thirty thousand dollars from one investor that's the biggest but most of the time i'm just getting investments from people that would do like they would do you know a producer perk on an indiegogo for like five hundred dollars or a thousand dollars i'm able to go to that person and say hey you know what making an investment you can actually make some money back yeah yeah, yeah. 
and I'm able to with movies probably twenty thousand or under. I'm typically able to you know just from five hundred dollars or thousand dollar investments, I'm able to get you know a good chunk or even all of that budget together. That's to, that's really not working out right now during the pandemic. That's been impacted by this pandemic a lot because I'm going to just regular everyday people. A lot of regular everyday people are really hurting financially right now. What are some of the projects that you have on the horizon besides your deal with Shutter? Um, let's see here. Well, we actually had planned this year we were going to start um, getting into some of our own original uh, productions. We were going to, I think we had two movies on our slate for this year. Um, we're actually going to be, uh, it's going to be under its own label. Um, so we're going to have the sales side and the actual production side. Uh, sales side is Saifuno Ventures. The production side of things is going to be called uh, Silver Bullet. And that will be, uh, hopefully we'll be able to uh, pick up those plans uh, next year. So, um, we are just... Right now, we're continually working to expand our network to uh, to even bigger and better uh, distributors. We're always on the lookout for for new distribution companies as well. Um, you know, we do a very thorough vetting process, though. We make sure that you know all the companies that we work with, they are companies that you know they're honest, they're legitimate, they're not they're not scamming people in any way. Uh, and unfortunately, you know, there's a lot of those out there. How would you say is the best way to it for an upcoming filmmaker to avoid getting scammed? Because it seems to be such a big part of the industry. If you're a new filmmaker, and especially if you've like never like done film distribution before, I highly recommend a, a sales agency because uh, distribution is a minefield. If you do not know who is who and who is honest, people are getting you know, screwed over all the time. I've, I've seen uh, one of my friends just recently uh, went with a, uh, with a distribution company. And unfortunately, they are a distribution company that's been picking up a lot of films recently, but um, nothing good is coming out of them for the filmmakers involved. This guy was promised like a $100,000 MG and nothing, he didn't get anything. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, there's, there's a lot of good companies out there, but there's a lot of bad ones too. So your company is named Silver, uh, the, your production company, you're calling it Silver Bullet. Is this uh, your way of trying to push the werewolf concept out to put the, to no, plant that seed a little more? The, um, the, the trying to plant the seed for more werewolf films is my little personal thing. Okay. Uh, the, both the names, uh, Saifuno Adventures and Silver Bullet, are uh, creations of my partner, Adam. Okay. So uh, your bio said that you dabbled in paranormal investigation. So how did you get into that? And, and have you had any notable experiences? Um, well, when I first moved out here to Buffalo, um, my first job out here was uh, assistant manager at a radio shack. And my, my boss, the, the manager of the store, was a guy named uh, Chaz Saya, who I'm still friends with. Hi, Chaz. Um, and he actually was a part of a, a local, uh, paranormal investigation group. Um, and I, he, I told him a little bit about how I'd been involved with some movies already and how one of them at the time I had been trying to help get funding for what was supposed to be a, um, television paranormal investigation TV show, um, ended up going nowhere, but I told him about that. And he mentioned that he was with this paranormal group. I asked if maybe I could come on a few investigations and yeah, I ended up, I was a part of the group for a little bit. Um, no longer part of the group because unfortunately the paranormal investigation community, I, it's a very, very toxic community. There are lots of backstabbing and drama. It's not fun. Uh, uh but yeah, I did have some, uh, some interesting experiences. Um, we've got, uh, one place uh, up here in Western New York, uh, Niagara Falls is about like 40 minutes north of us. There's a theater up there called the, the Rapids Theater. It used to be a, like a traditional stage theater, uh, but now they use it for, uh, for concerts. A lot, of the, uh, a lot of the bigger bands that come through end up using that as their venue. Like um, 
and a lot of them have experienced things there, which is interesting. Snoop Dogg uh, had a some sort of experience in his dressing room. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's a very old building, and the the paranormal group I was with had the exclusive rights to do investigations there. In fact, uh, every year for Halloween, they would actually do um, they would do tours. They would do uh, paranormal investigation tours where people would. You know, they buy tickets and we'd take them through the building and try to conduct an investigation, see what happens. Now, on one of those, uh, we had uh, a report of a door in the basement closing. Uh, so the next time we went back, we tried to see if we could like rep um, replicate or get something else to happen in that vicinity. So the basement of this building, it's like a super old building, concrete basement. And um, there's these... Uh, two rooms on the one end that have these huge, like, heavy metal doors. And uh, we went into that room. That's where the, the experience supposedly happened. Um, we propped the door, mostly closed, but we put, like, a I think it was, like, a bucket in the way so it couldn't close all the way. And we tried to do an EVP session, uh, Electronic Voice Phenomena, where we would uh, ask questions and try to see if we could uh, record any answers on a recording device. Um I had the idea, I yelled out, hello, is anyone here? We're trapped down here in this room. No sooner did that happen, and understand we were by ourselves in this building. The building was locked, all the power was off, we were just going around with flashlights, the building was all to ourselves, and everyone was accounted for in this room. No sooner did I yell that out, we heard, we heard footsteps come running down the basement stairs, run through the basement, and stop outside the door. Yeah, that, was, that was creepy <laughs> as hell. Um, another one that was really messed up. There's this one house. Um, it's not super close. Uh, it's down towards the, the Pennsylvania border. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called the Hinsdale House, also known as the, the Dandy House. Uh, the last family to live there was back in the 80s, the Dandy family. Mm -hmm. That house is screwed up i've been told by a psychic whatever is there is not demonic but it is definitely not friendly uh, back in like colonial days um it was the site of a native american massacre uh, apparently it became a stagecoach stop the guy that ran the stop like killed a bunch of people that came through uh it was the site of a failed exorcism is just really really screwed up stuff um, I don't think whatever is there likes me because it doesn't like to do stuff around me and which is interesting because the the dandies had had uh, a similar circumstance uh, if nothing would ever happen while their son was home the the one son um, but for me I mean I was I went upstairs the one time we were there and I was doing an EVP uh, session in the upstairs bedroom with my friend Chaz and um, I mean they saw that my my, uh, the rest of the team were downstairs in the living room. Uh, the, the living room is like, um, it's a very small house. The bottom of it is basically just the living room and the kitchen. And then there's uh, a stairs from the kitchen that lead up in the two bedrooms upstairs. Now, um, they saw through that door from the living room into the kitchen, apparently they, they saw a, they described it as an eight foot tall shadow figure. We heard them start yelling down there. We had no idea what they were saying. We came running down the stairs, and as soon as I ran down the stairs, it uh, zipped. There's a, there's a conjoined bathroom with the kitchen, mm -hmm. and it's weird because the basement door is in that bathroom. I don't know what kind of construction that is, but it's an old house. Who knows? The uh, And, yeah, so it went into that bathroom that leads into the basement. That's pretty um. I actually, uh, here in Buffalo, uh, after I ended up leaving that team, I tried doing a, a solo investigation myself. Um, I recruited a few local people, uh, plus my uh, former wife at the time. Um, and we actually investigated um, a local urban legend, uh, Pigman Road. Um, there's this road out in Derby, which is a more rural town about half hour from Buffalo. Uh, there's this road called Holland Road. 
which is nicknamed Pigman Road. Urban legend is that a uh, deformed serial killer lived on the road back in the uh, 1980s uh, and killed a whole bunch of people back there and that his ghost still haunts the road. Um, truth is stranger and much less and much more tragic unfortunately um there was a man that lived there uh he, he was horribly deformed um it's, it's very hard to find photos of him uh because a lot of them have been redacted by the uh he actually has surviving relatives and they've been trying to get his pictures off the internet um it, it, but it almost looked like uh chimerism honestly it looked like uh, it was almost two faces that almost didn't that were like starting uh, mostly fused together, but not quite. So it looked like there was like almost this cleft in the middle of it. Yeah, but I mean, he never hurt anybody. He um, he lived out on that road. He had a wife. Uh, his wife did die before him. Uh, but one Halloween, uh, some people <laughs> set fire to his house and he died in that fire. So he did die back there. Uh, what else I discovered um, that road is also significant because um there's there's actually two tunnels on the road where train uh train tracks go overhead and those train tracks about a mile fur uh, further down the road they were the site of one of the worst uh train accidents in u.s history um the what was that the angola horror is what it was called back in the 1800s i believe it was yeah eight, late 1800s uh, a train that on those tracks, so it had already gone past Holland Road, um, there's a big gorge with a bridge. And this train, uh, no one's exactly sure what happened, uh, but for some reason it ended up derailing. And I think it was the back three cars ended up going off the bridge. And oh, it, it was horrible because like back then it was winter and uh they had like the stoves going in the cars and literally they, they the cars just exploded on impact at the bottom of the gorge um there were no survivors now what's what's interesting is that and i haven't been able to confirm this or anything but supposedly Pigman, his real name was william derricks supposedly his father and uncle inadvertently Oh, not his father and uncle, his grandfather and uh, great uncle, I believe it was. They inadvertently caused the Angola horror. Apparently, they were um, they were kids. Uh, they were out trying to repair their fence, uh, looking for wood to repair it. And just being kids and not knowing any better, they took a tie off of the train tracks, apparently. Uh, so the train hit that spot, started losing control. Uh, they tried to hit the brakes to, you know, not crash. Uh, and they probably would have been fine, except they, they came to that bridge. And the bridge, um, just enough stabil instability still on the train that the, those back three cars ended up going off. Now, what's interesting is that I did bring a, um, a, a local psychic who I'm, who I'm friends with, uh, with me out to that road. She, for one thing, she... Um, she did sense that Williams there and she actually said that she saw him and I got, I, I did something interesting. I told you already, it's very, very hard to find pictures of this guy's face. Very hard. In fact, I had to do some computer trickery where I had to pull up some archived websites that, you know, aren't, aren't even live anymore, uh, just to find them. Um, so what I actually did is I printed up uh, a picture of William Derrick and I, and I printed up nine other pictures of various uh males with facial deformities and i presented them to her and she picked the right photo oh man wow so yeah and nine she also said that not only was he there but the the victims of the angola horror they're not at the crash site we actually went there too we, we looked around over there a little bit they're on holland road my 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 theory is that honestly they're they're there haunting Derek or William Derricks. They're basically uh, ghosts hunting another go uh, haunting another ghost because of his what his ancestors did. That's pretty fascinating. 
Uh, yeah, that's some fascinating stuff right there, dude. Now you have, I mean, so you're in horror movies and you've had a lot of experiences with the paranormal and, um, not, not a lot. I've been on probably okay. about maybe a dozen investigations. Well, um, more than the average person, yeah. I would say you have more experience <laughs> than the average person. And you seem to have done some good research on this, uh, the, the pig man, the, the urban mm -hmm. legend behind it. Would you be ever interested? Cause I know you're not interested in directing and perhaps either writing or producing a film about this or making a documentary about it or discussing your experiences in documentary form. We actually were going to do it as a documentary. Um, we did our investigation of, of the road. We actually, we, it was a huge thing. We worked with the local police department, local fire department. Um, and we had them like coordinating it. I mean, it's a back road. Almost no one goes down it anyway, but they were there like keeping us safe. Cause we were there after dark. Uh, we were there probably from like 11 to 3 AM, uh, 11 PM to 3 AM. Um, and we were, we were recording with the intention of, you know, if we got good stuff, we were going to turn it into, uh, like a documentary and I was going to have it be like half, like the actual historical, um, like facts behind the urban legend. I was also, I was doing interviews with people like the town historian, and um, a whole bunch of different people uh, that like live, used to live on the land. Um, and then the other half would have been the footage from the actual investigation. Um, but the investigation side of things, we didn't end up getting too much. So it just kind of ended up not working out. I mean, you can't really, unfortunately you can't um, make the paranormal, you know, perform on command. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, the closest thing we did get, we did get one small EVP, um, which was, it was a whisper, a male voice whispering Millie. Uh, his wife's name was Mildred, uh, Milfred. Milfred. Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, one of the tunnels, I actually, I got a whole bunch of cool equipment and stuff. One of them was an IR camera. Um, I, and um, we saw that one of the, one of those tunnels that goes underneath the train tracks for some reason, one of the walls, uh, I think it was on the left side, um, just like a concrete wall, it was like 20 degrees hotter than the wall on the other side. It was like showing up bright red in our, in our thermal. And um, there, was, there was no explanation for that. We had the fire chief, like I said, we, the fire department was out there with us. I, I showed that to the fire chief. I mean, they use they use IR cameras uh, for a ho for uh, house fires to tell like where a fire is in the house, that type of thing. So they're very used to that type of equipment. He said he'd never seen anything like that before. Hmm. Interesting. I mean, it should have just been you know air temperature. The sun had been down for hours, um, and it was just you know concrete. Con that's what happens with concrete. You know, it's should be a uniform temperature at that point matching the air. Yeah. Hmm. Has um, there ever been like, um, with regards to this case, has there ever been a documentary on any of this or is this just urban legends? There's never been anything filmed about one it. Of my, one, of my, uh, one of my local filmmaking friends actually made a um, uh, slasher movie about the, the urban legend side of it uh, not too long ago. Um, but there's not, one of the reasons I did it was for the challenge of it because outdoor investigations are a lot more difficult than indoor investigations. And I kind of did that out of spite uh, towards my former team because they'd never done any outdoor investigations. So I basically said, okay, I'm going to go do this something you've never done before just to show you I can. And then <laughs> so I, I, uh, I did that. Um, it's, you know, outdoor, it's just, very difficult. I mean, we did have to postpone it uh, a week uh, due to rain. Um, so there's a lot of factors you can't control. And it's also, you know, it's a lot more difficult. It's a lot bigger space. There's not nearly as ample supply of power. I mean, I had the, the car and I had a, a, a adapter for the, uh, the outlet in it so I could run some power out there. And I did still put up, um, I, I actually had a Samsung security system that I used to bring with me to set up throughout locations to record. I still had that, but I mean, it's, it was a corded system and the co wires only go like a hundred feet. So <laughs> but it's, it's only, so, it's a, it's a big road. There's only so much you can do. Yeah. 
So when when you said the uh, paranormal investigation world is is toxic, is is that mostly talking about uh, investigators pointing at other investigators saying that their evidence is fake? There's also a lot of racism. There's a lot of racists in the paranormal community. Oh wow! Um, very very backwards beliefs, and unfortunately, I think a lot of it stems from um, just that uh, a general gullibility. I mean, I believe in the paranormal because I've experienced the paranormal. In my eyes, that's the only reason anyone should believe in the paranormal. With today's <laughs> technology, you can fake any video or picture. Um, but, you know, I think a lot of these people in the industry are just, uh, in the paranormal community, are just gullible people who have never had an experience. They just believe in it because someone told them. And that's the same type of small-minded people that you see are often racists. Uh, I see. <laughs> Man. You, I've noticed, and I've noticed because you run a horror group, and I've watched how you've run a horror group. Um, we, I mean, as a horror podcast, we try to be a little bit honest. Do you think that the horror community might have some of the same issues with regards to racism to a lesser extent? Because well, to a much, much lesser extent. I mean, okay. we have we have a couple niche groups that try to like basically claim the horror community um as you know their own but i mean the vast majority of the horror community pushes back and does not welcome them um i mean most film most um horror conventions for example they're usually very good about that kind of thing i mean i've seen days of the dead is right now in hot water for that type of stuff um i guess there was some uh, memorabilia at their uh, convention that was very very questionable um, but I mean, yeah, I what, 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 wait, 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 I didn't hear about this. What was uh, the memorabilia? It was, it was, it looked pretty racist. It was not good stuff. Uh, okay. someone was selling something there and they just featured the photo of the dude on their Twitter, I guess. Um, but, uh, the other one, I, I went to rock and shock a couple of times. Uh, that one's no longer around anymore, but out in Boston, um, I mean, that, the one year that um, one of the people that they were going to have at their convention, that was the right after that, um, the Las Vegas shooting, he said he wished uh, some some guest that they, they were going to have made some sort of public statement trying to be being a funny guy without thinking, saying that he wished that the people shot were like juggalos or something. And that the festival kicked him out. They wouldn't let him come back. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, a lot of them, you know, they, they do take very um uh they, they, they do, do take steps uh and they do definitely uh, keep an eye out for that type of thing and that's i think that's a very good thing for the industry as a whole that people are being held to some sort of accountability i think we definitely have a ways to go to get to where we need to be uh but i think we're on the right track so i wanted to ask you one more question about your career uh can you recall some of the most difficult times in your career and what got you through it and what kept you going? Um, I mean, having money stolen from me from the director of my first film was annoying. Um, he was just a very unprofessional individual. He didn't even spell my name correctly in the credits. He, my last name was spelled as Lopper. Um, <laughs> yeah, very, just a joke of a human being. Um, I mean, I've had some, like a lot of near misses, like as far as like uh, the funding side of things, the films that I've tried to find funding for and have just had uh, fall through, like some of them were very exciting projects. So, I mean, those were very disappointing when they just ended up not working out for me. Um, but I mean, I've also, obviously, I've had success, so I just, you know, I just keep trying. That's the only thing you can really do. Yeah. Uh, and when you're dealing with stuff like that, you just got to not be afraid uh, to go out there and, you know, potentially set yourself up for failure. Because, I mean, especially with the, the funding stuff, I mean, there's people I might not even know uh, seeing my posts, just complete strangers, you know. Uh, and it's just, you know, it's. You gotta not, you gotta not be afraid of that. Okay. Yeah, because you're you're gonna fail and you're gonna fail until you don't. Exactly. Right. We wanted to thank you so much for coming on our podcast and uh, giving your time to us. A lot of interesting stories you gave us. 
Is there anything you want to leave with the audience or impart before you go? Um, you know, I would just say, um, well, first off, thank you for having me on your podcast today. Uh, otherwise, I would just say, you know, um, whether you're a filmmaker or you're just a, a fan of films, you know, go, go check out our website. Uh, we've got most of our catalog of films that we've repped uh, listed there, I think. There's a lot of good stuff. Um, you know, check out some of our movies. We've got a lot of them on Shutter. Uh, no, on uh, Tubi. We've got the one on Shutter, one on Hulu right now, Carrion. Um, and uh, yeah, if you wait, that movie's if, yours, Carrion. Uh, it's one of the ones we yeah, grabbed. Yeah, yeah. I almost watched that the other day. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we didn't even know it was going to end up on Hulu until I saw it on their um, coming soon, just while I was browsing through. <laughs> um, That's cool. But yeah, I, mean, I would say if, you, if you're a filmmaker, you know, um, consider reaching out. If you have a product that you're looking to uh, get distribution for, um, you know, it's no obligation just talking to us. Uh, we still allow filmmakers to keep com complete control of their films. If we get offers for somebody, I mean, we'll advise on which offer we think is best. Uh, but final decision is always the filmmakers. Um, so, I mean, you know, never hurts to see what's out there. Well, th judging by what you've talked to us about today, I'd, I'd like to bring our film to you and see if, see if that'd be inter of interest to you. Yeah, I'd love to have a look. That'd be great. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank, thank you, you for having me on. All right. Thank you so much, John. We hope you have a wonderful day. You as well. Horror show exclusive. All right. We hope you enjoyed that interview with John Laper. Um, join us next week where we discuss, we're going to discuss movies like The Wicker Man, cult classic that has been under our radar for quite a while and a couple of other movies and we're going to have more interviews and a lot of uh interesting things in the future yeah and keep up with us on social media pickles horror show on uh both facebook and instagram and also twitter and we just finished our circus big circus of the dead contest so what so watch out for more contests coming up as well where we gave away some signed dvds till next week happy horror, happy horror.